This is new. Welcome to the first edition of the Dive Bomb Indie Car Podcast, new to Spotify and on the Dive Bomb YouTube channel, where me and a brand new team will be discussing IndyCar race by race as the season goes on. As many of you guys hopefully get into IndyCar and want to learn more about the series. This is Dive Bomb IndyCar and this is the team. I'm going to introduce myself first. You've probably heard me all over the YouTube channel before, but I'm Dan Jones, correspondent of IndyCar on Project Dive Bomb. Bit about me, I've been a lifelong motorsport fan, but I picked up IndyCar about three to four years ago. And for my first ever race, which was the 2020 Indianapolis 500, I basically just couldn't take my eye off it. And ever since then, I've been watching IndyCar with great intent, getting more and more um, into it throughout the series. Um, as it progressed and progressed, and then um, as part of Project Dive Bomb, I do the correspondency role for IndyCar, reporting and previewing all the races, as well as uh, writing some little articles on the website, um, if you want to check them out. Um, IndyCar has always been a uh, really interesting sport to me. I'm really glad um, to see it grow um, as I've been watching the series, especially with the big names coming over like Roman Grosjean, um, for example, which, which brought many other fans over and sort of the global increasing presence of IndyCar in the F1 scene, such as Alex Pillow, Colton Herta and Pato Award looking at F1 moves. For me in IndyCar, I am a massive Pato Award fan and the listeners of the Power Rankings podcast will be fully aware of my um, my interests of Pato Award and the frustrations that I usually receive um, watching him race, but we'll get onto that a bit later. And I also keep an eye out for my man Augustin Canapino, a man who spoke absolutely no English at the start of the year, someone who no one had ever heard of, and everyone thought it was going to come last by about five laps. But no, I bet my man Augustin Canapino, who's had an absolutely brilliant start to the season, and I'm, I'm rooting for a bit of Canapino as well, and I think we need to make this a, a, weekly, a weekly segment of the podcast. Um, but we'll get more into that later. So that's a bit about me been watching IndyCar about three to four years. And all you need to know is I like Pato Ward quite a bit. Uh, I'm I'm Archie. Uh, I've been following uh, IndyCar maybe just a little bit less than Dan around the last three years. Properly got into it over the last couple of seasons. Uh, maybe not got quite as staunch an allegiance to a uh, single driver, but I'd like to say I'm a Scott McLaughlin fan. I think he epitomizes the personalities that, you know, make IndyCar so great. The drivers are, you know, they're all, they're all great personalities and there's a lot of good access to the sport, which allows you to sort of get to know the drivers maybe more than other racing series. I think also with McLaughlin, uh, his story coming from being a three-time supercars champion uh, to IndyCar and sort of rising quite rapidly through the ranks to become a championship contender in what is his third full season. Uh, it's quite impressive. I think what has sort of got me to like IndyCar is the racing product really is unrivaled. I mean, it's overtakes galore throughout the field, throughout every single race, um, including tight battles for the lead uh, to the extent that really a number of drivers could win on any given day. And the championship is often so predictable and could go right down to the wire. Uh, hi, I'm Zeki. I'm 17. And... Uh... I got into F, uh, to IndyCar uh, around 2020. I believe it was Road Atlanta. Um, my favorite driver is Pato Award because the friend, my friend who originally got me into IndyCar, he liked Pato Award, so I just went along with him. Um, the reason I love IndyCar is because I quite like F2, and I kind of see it as a much faster version of Formula 2, and the racing is so close. And uh, it, uh, uh, with no power steering, it requires a lot of skill. Uh, hi, I'm Ellie. I'm relatively new to um, IndyCar. I've only just started watching it at the beginning of this season. Um, I got into it because I was watching and listening to the Screaming Meals podcast, which has Max Armstrong on. And then listening to how he kind of moved on to IndyCar, I kind of followed it along with that. So I'm kind of learning as I'm going. And... Um, like taking in a lot of knowledge but yeah my favorite um driver is probably max armstrong and uh Callum as well but yeah there we are a whole mix of different indie car fans from project dive from coming in to create the dive from indie car podcast so a bit about the podcast just in case of you any well you'll be listening for the first time 
going to be doing race by race reviews. Hopefully, after every race, we're going to have a post race review discussing all the drama which there seems to be in every single indie car race and there's no boring races like a certain other major international series so there's always loads to talk about after every single indie car race as well as previews for the big events including the indianapolis 500 later on in the month hopefully we'll be able to get a couple of drivers on as well from the world of indycar and much more relatable getting an f1 driver on would be quite impossible but the great thing about indycar that is more than feasible to do so Hopefully we'll get a couple of figures on, uh, maybe post-race for a little interview. Who knows, the possibilities are endless on the IndyCar podcast, and we hope that you're going to stick around with us as we hopefully grow as a journey from where we are at the moment. So a whole range and a whole load to look forward to. But we are recording this just at the start of May, um, so we all know what that means. The Indianapolis 500 at the end of the month. We do have the Indianapolis road course and the qualifying before that. but. We've already had four races to start the season, and it has been a very, very mixed start to the season. There's been no real driver who's been able to muster it all together so far. Yeah, I think that a driver who has actually really impressed me is Roman Grosjean this year already. Yeah, for sure. Just because he's obviously been fast in uh, the other two seasons, or other season that he's been in uh, IndyCar. But he's really stepped it up this year, and uh, especially getting, I think, two pole positions now, I think. Yes, yes. And uh, unfortunately, he couldn't turn those into wins, but uh, he's always been right there. And I think that he's been doing very well this season so far. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Roman Grosjean should be leading the standings. I don't think many of you guys are going to argue that. St. Petersburg... He was on for victory. I think we're all in that ball was in McLaughlin's court. Um, he was responsible for that incident. Texas, admittedly, was his fault. Um, for Grosjean, just was it two laps to go, he crashed. But without doubt, the driver of the season so far. Yeah, um, I think even I think even Texas, it's like it showed a big step up from him because he's not always been the most comfortable on ovals, and to yeah. be running up sort of in and around the top five throughout, you know, that showed. You know, a big stride forward for him. I mean, it's definitely encouraging uh, for Andretti as well because we know that over form last couple of years has been pretty abysmal, to be honest. But Grosjean, as well, from a personal standpoint, someone who hasn't raced on ovals, to be running up there in the top five, he's one of six or seven who were on the lead lap. Um, the last one to be lapped by a ward before that caution came out. And really, he should have got two victories, a second and a fourth this year. Like, if things had gone his way this year, he'll be miles in front. Yeah, absolutely. But as it is, it's Marcus Ericsson leading the standings. And I think, uh, I mean, for those who listened to the season preview we did, uh, we spoke a lot about how consistency is a massive thing in IndyCar, where, you know, it's a series that's quite unpredictable. You'll get some anomalies in terms of results from drivers. And Ericsson's sort of always been up there in and around the top 10, even if he maybe hasn't been, you know, taking all the headlines or even has been quite quiet in races. Uh, obviously, took the win uh, in St. Pete, maybe slightly fortunate because of Pato Awards. Uh, slight, like, engine issue. I don't know the exact technical terms of what happened, but... Um, and then subsequent races, I think he finished eighth in Texas, which, again, it wasn't flashy, but it was respectable. Third in Long Beach, it could have... You know, Kyle Kirkwood, who maybe we'll get on to, won that race, but Ericsson could have been further up there challenging if he hadn't been caught a little bit in the mess of O'Ward crashing or for a second time being caught up in one of his own incidents. And then uh, Ericsson, he, t he took 10th in Barber, but again, it's enough to consolidate him, uh, his position at the top of the standings. Yeah, and I, I kind of feel like this is why like IndyCar is so good where obviously in other racing categories, someone like Roman Grosjean or uh, Marcus Erickson have struggled, but then they come to IndyCar and they show why that they're like very talented drivers. And I think with, again, with, with the racing so close uh, with, I think the past few races only being separated by, like a second or two, 
I think especially that's it shows who the most talented drivers are in the field. I think that's really important for Yeah, and I, I also think I also think the value of consistency was shown, obviously, for those who may be new to the series, who uh, Will Power last season won the championship having won one race. His teammate Joseph Newgarden won five races, but he still fell short. Even Scott McLaughlin won three races, but Power, because of that sort of consistency, he managed to win the championship with four less race wins, which is, you know, that's impressive. Yeah, and I've got to say, um, there's, it's really good that there's been no real standout performer. Yes, okay, Grosjean has been by far and away the most impressive driver of the year so far, but the fact of the matter is he lies fifth in the standings. And Ericsson, I wouldn't say he's been in my top five drivers so far this year. Pato Award will be very frustrated with not being leading the standings. That was obviously he got misfortune, misfortune in both St. Pete and Texas, but obviously Long Beach is fully his responsibility. And I think, even think McLaughlin would be frustrated that he's not leading the championship because at the end of the day, he threw away his own second place at St. Petersburg. So. The, it's just so great that there's so many people who could be up there right now, but it, it's always not necessarily the best driver at the top. It's the one who is the most consistent. I mean, you've got to look at Joseph Newgarden. In he's he's sixth at the moment, which is actually quite surprising because it feels like he's had a you know a season that's been riddled by a bit of misfortune. I mean, he won in Texas, and maybe after there we were saying you know he might look the best sort of the early pick for the championship, but. I mean, he was unfortunate at St. Pete. He had some sort of car issue that uh, saw him retire near the end. Um, then that look kind of has just persisted, really. I'd, I think it was some sort of fueling issue. It meant he had to go sort of fuel save excessively at Long Beach. And then contact with Felix Rosenqvist uh, early. Uh, I think it was right at the start uh, at Barber. Yeah. Gave him some damage that ultimately seemed to hinder him later in the race even if it wasn't sort of major damage and he still showed some decent pace you know it still meant he couldn't really fight for the win yeah Penske have had a really weird start to the year they just don't look like the Penske who win week in week out like New God obviously won in Texas and McLaughlin's won in Barber but power has been sort of nowhere and apart from apart from that Texas race like even in St. Petersburg and Alabama New God wasn't wasn't really in the mix yeah, and I, th I think it's an interesting point you make about power because maybe last season he kind of had some results that went under the radar, but he has been like really, he's been really quiet to start this season. He's seventh in the championship. He's still only 26 points adrift. And obviously, even within one or two races, things can swing sort of drastically. Absolutely, for sure. There's been some other drivers who really have suffered starts. I was chatting to a friend about it the other day. Colton Herta is one who I just cannot get my head around. Like we, We've mentioned this of Grosjean, but Andretti have made absolute leaps and bounds from where they were last year. Like they On Rose Street and Ovals, they look like they can win this year. We, I don't think there was a single point where anyone said Andretti would comfortably be at the front at any race last year. And now Grosjean's been the best driver of the season so far. Kirkwood obviously won in Long Beach. Obviously, other results haven't gone his way so well. But Herter's just been nowhere. Like, Long Beach was all right. Long Beach was there. But especially at Long Beach, the track he's gone out so well. You wouldn't expect him to be behind both Kirkwood and Grosjean. Uh, uh, that's you exactly what I was, was going to say. Because looking at it, he's only five points ahead of Callum Eilat, who is who is... He's only in his second year. And yeah, Colton, who was a championship contender... And he's looked at as one of the more talented drivers in the series. And he's down in seven, in 10th. And I believe over, I think almost a race win behind uh, the championship leader. So yeah, it's a big surprise of why he's struggling compared to his teammates. Yeah, I mean, Colton Herter, last three, four years, he's always seemed like he's going to be that guy. He's going to be the guy that dominates IndyCar. But the last year and a half, I'm just thinking... Is this guy really the future of IndyCar? Like, his performances aren't convincing convincing me enough. I look at someone like Palo or O'Ward, and I think, yeah, they're the ones who are going to win titles five or six years down the line when we see the, the powers the Dixers go. But for, for Kurt, I just can't see it happening. 
Yeah, and it's it yeah, it's really surprising to see uh, that it's it's one of those guys where you expect him to be, you know, at the front and like constantly at the front and challenging the championship leader. So yeah, to see him down here is is really surprising. And like what you guys said before with uh the consistency, he just he's shown that in recent years that he can be consistent, but it's just this year it just seems like he can't seem to make that step that uh, like Grosjean has. And he just seems to not have the confidence. Yeah, I think the contrast with uh, Pelo is a particularly stark one because whereas Pelo's maybe had a, you know, a fairly quiet start to the season, he's still third in the standings, nine points behind Ericsson. Whereas Herta has been quiet, but He's not been quietly performing as such in the yeah. way that Pelo has. I mean, the thing about Pelo, his all the seasons have been IndyCar. He's just done the job, and he's done the job well. Like, I, is he, I don't think he's ever had a pole position. Or well, no, he might have had a few. Maybe it was last season he didn't get pole position. But that kind of just sums up Pelo for me. He's not particularly incredible over a lap, but he just gets the job done week in, week out, which is something that Colt and Herter just doesn't do. Like, I see them as two opposite drivers. Herter, on his day, is by far and away the quickest driver in IndyCar, but has absolutely zero consistency. Whilst Pelo, yeah, he's quick, but he's you wouldn't put him as the quickest over one lap. But because of how consistent he is, you'd probably put him top three drivers in the grid, maybe? Yeah, I think it's so important to be that sort of reliable performer, more so than it maybe is to... You know, show those flashes of incredible pace, but only do it, you know, on sort of odd occasions throughout the season. Yeah, what a loss he's going to be for Chip Ganassi Racing at the end of this year. He's McLaren will be licking their lips at the start of next season. If they've got probably the two best youngsters in IndyCar, as well as Alexander Rossi, who by no means is, is a slouch in IndyCar terms, they're going to be right. I, what, I think they'll be, they'll be. Only Penske maybe will be challenging them in a couple of years' time. I mean, Ro Ro it's funny you mentioned Rossi because he's had a very strange start to the season. He's 14th in the standings after, I don't know, he's just, you've not really noticed him doing anything. He had his, it was a suspension failure at the end at Long Beach. I think he was running somewhere in the top 10, but, and then Texas, he had the incident in the pit lane with Kirkwood. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, he finished four. Was it fourth in St. Pete? Yeah, but then again, that was only because he just kept out all everyone's issues. Yeah, exactly, and that was that was was necessary at St. Pete. That was uh, that was some race. I mean, him and Rosengris have had very similar starts to the year. They've just been lounging around in about seventh to tenth. They haven't really done anything of note. Okay, yeah, Rosengris got pulled in Texas, but other than that, they've been. Reasonably quiet. I mean, Award stood out, obviously, apart from his Long Beach antics, but Award's been particularly impressive compared to those two. I thought Rossi might be challenging Award a bit more, but we also got to give him time. Obviously, he's moving to Chevy Engine, he's in a different team. But Yeah, and I think it's important to note as well that it's a whole, with it being a whole new car that's been added to the uh, McLaren team, it's going to take new time for those, the sort of new personnel to bed in as well as you know, a new driver. Yeah, actually, another driver who's kind of surprised me this season and not in a particularly great way is actually Renus VK, um, who, I don't know, I see him usually as someone who can fight for podiums. I don't know. Maybe I've got that wrong, but I, he's just very, I, I don't know. I see, he just hasn't really performed to what I thought he would be. When did VK have his accident? Was it sometime in 21? Because I remember he had a really good start to 2021. But then he had an accident and then he just disappeared ever since then. I mean, obviously, he does. He seems to turn up to Indianapolis every year and perform quite well. But he's just never, ever since his accident, he's never looked the same driver. I think it's just been a struggle for that whole Ed Carpenter crew, really. Yeah. Uh, Connor Daly's spoken about you know, he just wants to get to Indy now, get to the road course, get to, uh, you know, the 500, because in the open test, he was, I think he was second behind Newgarden. Obviously, there's caveats of, 
you know, who got who got a slipstream and all of that. But you know, daily goes well there, VK goes yeah. well there. So ECR can... always go well there. I think they're probably the team that make the biggest step at, step up at Indy. Um huge couple last couple of years we've seen it's been McLaren, Ganassi and Carpenter. So I wouldn't be surprised to see those three again this year. Yeah, me neither. But I, th- I think another one, something to look out for, I think Penske looked stronger in the open test. Yeah. I think it's an interesting one, the open test, because it's a month prior. The temperatures might be different. It's, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to judge, really. And I think, I don't know, it might have been Ganassi weren't even running a 500 car. So that's another you know, big thing. And it's more just sort of getting their eyes in and you probably won't tell the true pecking order until it gets to the uh, several practice sessions we have in the uh, lead up. Yeah, no, absolutely. But obviously we've had a room that's good and bad. I think the one other driver who stands out to me this year is going to be Marcus Armstrong. Um, again, he's, he's kept himself out of trouble in St. Pete. Obviously he wasn't at Texas. That was Sato. Um, Long Beach, he did a sterling effort all race. Um, in Alabama, obviously, you have that incident in qualifying uh, with Lungard. Um, but he recovered. He recovered quite well. Yeah, and I think, again, like another a driver who's come from Formula 2 and going, gone to IndyCar and has actually done pretty well. And that feeds into a theory I have that if Nicholas Latifi <laughs> comes over to IndyCar, he will be the champion. Just saying. That's fair enough. <laughs> <program. laughs> I mean, I've got to say, the three who have moved, moved over from F2, Armstrong, Eilat, and Lingard, have all stood out, but for good reasons. Um, Eilat, obviously, Hunkos last year was that one team operation, and particularly towards the end of the year, I think it was Laguna Seca in particular, it was running really well. And Lungard, again, similar to Eilat, towards the end of last year, in a the Rahul Letterman Lanigan team who are in a decline, he was, he was right up there. I think this it's weird. I think it shows that maybe results in F2 aren't necessarily conducive to maybe how good the drivers are. There's a lot of caveats and you've seen three of them now and especially Armstrong. He's, you know, I think he maybe finished 13th in the championship last year. Yet he comes over to IndyCar and he's, he's doing an impressive job. Yes, it's with Ganassi who are a strong team, but He's shown a lot of potential in these early races, and you never know. Maybe later in the years, in the year, he could uh, still uh, drive the three remaining ovals because it's. I think Sato's only signed Sato's, up for yeah, Texas and Indy. Indy. Yeah, so yeah. He could, could well do Iowa and Gateway. But yeah, I mean, as it is, sorry, so- as it as it is, um, I think Armstrong's looking the best place in the rookie of the year standings, especially given. Rob and Peter Peterson aren't really yeah. they, they haven't really been anywhere. Yeah, I think as much as we, we do love Canapino, he's he's not gonna beat Armstrong. Um unfortunately. I think, I think as like soon as like as not soon, but like the quicker that they get used to the cars, then I feel like the better he perform. And I think like seeing how this is like the first couple of races in the year, I think I'm excited to see what he can do like later on when he properly gets used to it and figures out like all the ins and outs of the car. Yeah, absolutely. I do like send me to Lungard on his debut in, in the Indy Road course in twenty one, he like flew I think he qualified fourth or something like absolutely ridiculous. Like he beat like full timers like straight off the bat and he started on that day and towards the end of the last he was picking up the pace and if Armstrong can can impress already in his first three races, if we send a Ganassi, like who's to say he's not gonna be Challenging for the far six, challenging for podiums. By no means an impossible feat, I don't think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he definitely showed his racecraft to come pretty much from the rear of the field at Barber. Recovered to 11th. That was after taking 8th at Long Beach in only a second race. I think the potential is definitely there. But to be honest, Dan, I think it's about time you give to, yeah, you give Canapino his dues because he definitely deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, um, I think in the... Well, in the... Pure season podcast. I think 
we did unfairly right off canopy you know we just we did have a half-hearted i mean it's a bit harsh but i think we all knew that you'd be slugging at the back but i've got to say canapino has really impressed me he's a guy who didn't speak english at the start of the year he had no experience of any single seaters let alone a, an indie car and yet he's he's performed much better than expected he's comfortably been better than peterson and rob um so far this season and i think the 12th in texas just blew me away well, he's never driven on Novel. It was the second race in the single seater. He still couldn't speak. He, he could hardly speak English still. And he, I think he was only one lap down. And there was 10, 15, 10-ish drivers who had finished behind him. 10, 15 drivers. And he was he was challenging. Like, I thought on a Novel he'd be several laps down slugging it out. But no, he's really, really impressed me. And even in Indy, open test. Yes, it is the open test. But he looked all right. Eilat was all over the place. And Canapino was just doing a solid effort. It's, it's just a really pleasant surprise to see someone like him who's come from the depths of Argentina just to really leave a positive impact. Again, I don't think it could be undervalued how tough it is moving from a one to a two car operation as well. And the fact that he has performed so well coupled with you know that challenge of adding that second car is seriously impressive. And for someone who's never, you know, driven open wheel cars at any high level, it's, yeah, that's a serious feat. And to be partnered up with Ilot. Yeah. What did you like to do before coming to uh, Indigar? So Canapino raced in Argentine touring cars, believe it or not. So... I don't even know how to describe Argentine touring cars, but let's just say it's not very reputable series. Um, I have this yeah. Wiki- Wikipedia article here, and it's just it's like nineteen different series. Yeah, that he's raced in. Argentine motorsport is an absolute mess and a half. But do you know? Fun fact about Canapino, he won the Argentine Sportsman of the Year, so he actually won the same award as Lionel Messi. So that's two goats yeah. and two goats one award. He's an absolute king That's over a... there. I mean, for the 500, that delivery they have uh, revealed, yes. which is in partner with the uh, Argentine Argentina national team, uh, which is basically the uh, the colours of their jersey, which is, you know, that it's an, it's an impressive looking car. Yeah, like it's just just such a surprise, especially for someone who. Let's be honest, none of us, had, well, I don't think anyone had heard of Canapedo before this year. Um, and everyone was like, oh, it's some dodgy Argentine pay driver, which instead is probably some well-funded, state-backed Argentine driver. But, you know, he's, I think everyone's enjoying Canapino's presence. Like, I feel everyone's enjoying his journey. Um, and it's, it's nice to see. Like, I'm glad to see that he's not last by 10, 10 seconds a race. He's... He's genuinely fighting, fighting for his own. And it's his first, like you said, first season in single seaters at 33 as well. Yeah, he's, so... he's not exactly a, a young one, is kind of, you know. So, genuinely, I think one of the most, well, it's definitely one of the most underrated drivers of the season for me. And that's shown by McLaughlin. Touring cars to IndyCar might be some weird viable option for any, like, any, any touring car drivers. It just shows the talent that's in this field as well. The sort of adaptability to be able to go from one vastly different series to come to, you know, a completely different series again and be so versatile as to adapt this quickly. You know, it's very impressive and it does speak to the talent that's in IndyCar. That, and that is one reason why people definitely should watch the series. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I said this. Um, in the video once, but the amount of different series. So you've got drivers from F1, Ericsson, Grosjean, very competitive. You've got um, kind of the the newer indie lights generation, so Award, Kirkwood, Herter, that sort of lot. The kind of the veterans, New Garden, Power, Dixon, and then you've got people from Argentine touring cars, Australian supercars, Alex Palo from the Super Formula. It's just a really random but really enjoyable mix because they're all on a pretty level playing field and it kind of shows 
maybe not all the best drivers are located in the best series. I think in certain series as well, like in F1, I think it's like, I don't know how to describe it. You can be like a really good driver, but if you're not in like a good team that can match it, like you, your skills aren't shown as much. So it's like as soon as you switch over into something else, I feel like you can... I don't know how to like describe it. When you change over, then you can just get used to like other cars, and um, you can. I don't know what I'm saying. No, no. I do yeah, definitely I... agree that you do get you do get a better opportunity in IndyCar, and it is great to see people who've resurrected their careers by performing well in IndyCar. Like Ericsson was an absolute nobody. Um, when he when he retired from F1, and p even people like Armstrong and Lungard, you can say, have saved their careers by moving over. But I think that's what Grosjean said, where he was, I think he, he had an interview a few years ago, like, just after he had left Haas and, I think, got his, like, first podium in IndyCar, where he was like, uh, someone could be in, like, a Haas in F1 and be the most talented driver. But, like, uh, what Ellie said, with it's, Talented is basically wasted with, like, the worst car on the grid. But you can go to IndyCar, and all the cars aren't completely equal, but they're as equal as you could possibly be. And you can actually show your talent and prove to people, like, why you're in high-level motorsport. Yeah, and people still stand out, right? So Eilat is in a, in a thing course, and let's be honest, like, if you look at it on a sheet of paper as a absolutely unknown you think that's quite average but he's actually one of the future stars of indycar despite his results on paper not showing for it and that's like kind of the beauty of it there's so many drivers who you can race in a team low down the field but still still show the world what you're about oh he's driving the wheels off that car and he's definitely flying the flag for his brits yes yes I, i'm with all respect to jack harvey i don't think he's yeah actually the same job I was going to say, there's a few other drivers. Maybe we should just quickly brush over and mention. I think Jack Harvey's one of them. He showed promise at Long Beach. I think, yeah, he was running around the top 10. But I think he, even then he dropped back to around 15th in the end. And yeah. he's, just been no, he's just been nowhere again. You know, I've, you know, I'm holding out hope for him. But I mean, it's, it's upsetting a... to see because at MSR, he was... Promising. I'm not going to say he was one of the best drivers in IndyCar, but uh, when he was at Myershank Racing, he was a, a very respectable driver. He he got the results, and I I really thought RLL would be a really positive career move for him, but he's just gone a bit backwards, unfortunately. I think, and, I think he's running out of time now as well. Yeah, the contract. Well, I mean, you know, it's a contract year for him, I think, and with the performances at the moment they might look elsewhere. Yeah, and with rumours flying about. Of Who's going to take what seat? And already silly season, already, already starting. I think he's going to be in big trouble. Uh, what other drivers do we think we should touch on? I think, I think the Myershank Racing guys. I think they've they've dropped off as well. Sort of maybe in the same bracket as the RLL crew, the ECR crew. They just don't really seem anywhere. Castro I mean, Neves has made Myers some mistakes. Myershank just looking forward to Indianapolis. Really, I think. That's the. I mean, let's be honest. The operations of that number six car is to get Helio a, a fifth and D five hundred. I think is the absolute priority in that car. He's, I still am doubtful whether he's worth a full time entry. Um, but yeah, they should. But they they're going to be focusing on Indy at the end of the day. They want to get Castro Neves that record breaking title and Pagano's show to be no means slouch in Indy either. And I think that's just their main focus of the year really. Yeah, agreed. Also, I kind of want to talk about uh, Kyle Kirkwood as well. Um, I think he's also been a very impressive driver. I think last year he came in, what, 20-something? Wasn't a Foyt, though. Got... Yeah. Sorry? Wasn't an AJ Foyt car, though. Did oh, he... yeah. He was in like a lower-level car, and uh, then he moves to Andretti, and then he's now sitting fifth, I believe, in the title. Uh, Championship. Drop to ninth. Drop to ninth. Drop to ninth. Oh, yes, yeah. Right. He had a, now, quite a poor Alabama. Yeah. But he did get his maiden win Absolutely. in Long Beach. I which... think 
it might be disrespectful with some of the other drivers, but I feel Kirkwood's was the only win this year you thought the right guy won today. Um, he was just, he just dominated. He just dominated start to finish. Yeah, and he to put be honest, weekend together. Sorry. Yeah, he did. Uh, uh, to be honest, I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't really know who he was uh, <laughs> during that win, and I was like, oh, he actually, he's actually pretty good, and then I looked a little bit more into him, and yeah, he's a very, he impressed me a lot this year, so far. Yeah, for sure, and again, it's that, it's that, um, it's that leaps and bounds Andretti obeyed from last year, his win was, was very impressive, and Andretti could have very well won three out of four races this year, like, how many did they win last year? They had, they had both the Indies, didn't they, but Rossi's was a bit, was a bit dodgy, um, so they had one legal victory last year, so, <laughs> As I said, leaps and bounds. And as Kirkwood, as I said, was I think it's the only driver who I think at the end of the race was like the right guy won today. Um, I'm definitely not salty about both St. Petersburg and Long Beach. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll touch over them. Soft, soft topic, those two races. We'll get a victory this season, don't worry. Um, <laughs> just as we look forward into the month of May, we're going to do some early early guessing um obviously it's always a risk taking predictions but indy 500 who are you thinking i mean i think pre-season i said polo so i might have to stick with my word and you know what i'm happy to stick with my word there he's been strong in recent years i've been you know up there fighting for the win um so yeah i'm going for polo especially given how strong in are. I think if he is, I think he is racing, but I think uh, Takuma Sato, yep. to be honest, I or think um, I'm holding out. If he does race in the IndyCar, the Indy 500, I think he'll win. Yes. Oh, I'll go with Callum then. Bold, bold, but I respect it. Um, I'm going to go with Gustin Calipate. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> um, McLaren, you know, McLaren's looking really good. Like, award his record speaks for himself. Like, Rossi, you know, he's always done well at Indy, won his debut and almost won in 2019, almost won in 2020. Tony Canaan's done IndyCar, the Indy 500, probably since about the 1600s. And Felix Rosen has always been very strong, so, you know, I, 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 I'm really, really looking forward to McLaren's chances, but uh, Scott Dixon's going to win just because he's Scott Dixon. So, there we go. I think I will just add, I think I'm going to be rooting for Connor Daly. He's hometown boy in uh, in Indy. So, and you know what? ECR have been relatively strong there. He seems to lead laps with decent frequency. So, you never know. One of these days, he could put it all together. The yearly Connor Daly leading the Indy 500 moment is always a very special moment when the commentators just... Lee Diffie and Talon and Bell have a little moment when Connor Daly leads. A little bit of excitement. You the know, crowd we need, we need every year. Yeah, the crowd erupt. Like, it would be... <laughs> we need... I, I don't think he's going to win, but I want to see him lead, lead again, you know? I think it's always a bit of fun when kind of daily leads. Yeah, leads that, that has been incredible. Side right, note, looking forward to the 2024 Indianapolis 500. Has anyone seen the Cole Larson seat fits? Yes, I have. I have seen that. I was watching... I saw that video uh, yesterday. Yeah, exciting. Exciting, isn't it, you know? I um, don't know if you guys are aware of what double duty is, but might be coming back next year. Yeah, does anyone even know what double duty is? No, I was about to ask, oh. what does that mean? <laughs> Archie, do you know what double duty is? Nope. Oh, right. It's, 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 it's something to do with racing na in NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. So um, the Indianapolis 500 happens in the morning of Memorial Day. In the evening... NASCAR hosts a race called the Coca-Cola 600 uh, at yes, Charlotte yes. Motor Speedway. And Double Duty is trying to do both the Indy 500 and the Coca-Cola 600 on the same day. So you do <laughs> 1,100 miles in one day. And I don't think it's been done since maybe 2014. But Larson's definitely doing Indy next year. And as a full-time NASCAR driver, it would be odd for him to drop out one of the biggest events of the year. So, there's a reporter for Formula Nerds, Morgan Holiday, uh, who might be listening. Uh, welcome if you are listening. 
Um, and me have been discussing quite a lot about double duty. Um, I have written an article on it for Dive Bomb or explaining what double duty is, so check it out. But the potential of a driver doing both the Indy 500 and the Coca Cola 600 very much excites me. Yeah, that would be exciting. And then, you know, imagine if he somehow upsets the odds and wins the 500 and then, yeah. goes, then goes off to Charlotte to race. I mean, <laughs> I mean. He's in a McLaren, and McLaren have always gone well at Indy, so... Maybe a bit optimistic, but you never know. It's optimistic, but if you were to pick any team for him to go in, I think McLaren would be probably the one you'd pick after Ganassi. So, sure. you never know. What I will say, though, uh, bumping is coming back as well. <laughs> I was we just going to bring that up. But yeah, um, Ederson... Getting the last minute call up, which means we will have bump day again, which is always one of the most exciting IndyCar days of the year. Bit of jeopardy, I think we we like that. We like that bit of jeopardy. What is bump day? So, good question. So, in the Indy 500 qualifying, only 33 cars are allowed to enter the race. So, but you, there's unlimited entries, so you could have. As many entries as you'd like. This year, there are 34 in entries into the Indianapolis 500, but only 33 cars are allowed to enter the race. So what happens during qualifying, they sort out, oh, is it 13 to 29, I think, on the first day? Then they have... Oh, I can't remember what the exact order is. Then I think they sort out the final grid. So what happens is... The people who went to the first qualifying, qualified between 30th and 34th, go out for their own qualifying runs. And this year, the slowest person out of those four will, will not qualify for the Indy 500. So bump days, the process of eliminating anyone, uh, eliminating the slowest drivers from the race. Okay. Could it be possible that two drivers are like, um, that, like two drivers tie for the slowest or? Um, theoretically, yes. But, but it's unlikely. A thousandth of a mile of an hour would be <laughs> particularly impressive to to equal on. Um, can't get any worse than it did in 2019 for me, being both an Alonso and a No Ward fan. So <laughs> let's look on the bright side. That's well, tough, actually, tough times. Quickly sticking at you with uh, McLaren. Have you guys seen the the three liveries that they're going to run? Yes, yes, no, um, the, the triple crown liveries. Um, which one looks the best? I'll be honest, I, I would, I would have said the, McCl the, uh, Marlboro kind of one. Rosencrist. I don't, yeah, I don't like the orange though. Yeah, I think to disguise it from tobacco advertising, they've made it orange. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I don't know, that, uh, doesn't really work for me. Yeah, I've got to say, all of them look really good. Like Rossi's, I like the um, the the orange and like dark blue combo. Yeah, I was going to bring it Rossi's. It's maybe the you know least out there one of them, but I do quite like Rossi's. It's it's very clean. It really reminds me of the 2018 McLaren F1 car. I yeah. don't know what it is, but it's yeah, that that's what, yeah. I saw it. I also saw an interesting theory for awards because it's so hot in Indianapolis. Loads of people are saying he's going to overheat. Um, yeah, I I saw stuff about this uh, relating to Kirkwood last season because he was in a he had a black car all season. Yeah, he was in the rocket, wasn't he? And I think black over black overalls as well. And it was a yes. it was quite an issue overheating. And you know it's it's physical, and that's one thing with IndyCar as well. It's physical, and you're racing in you know high temperatures, so it can be a struggle for drivers. And that's again why it's all so impressive that they. Come, I have to overcome this sort of physical barrier with the lack of power steering, and you know it just makes the drivers all that more impressive. Yeah, no, it's going to be a challenge for award, and I think it's a if there, it's an interest for award in that one. I, I guess McLaren didn't really consider the the factor of it, but with all respect to Tony Canal, Felix Rosenqvist, and Alexander Rossi, I think award probably the best out of them at Indy. So. I think just mentioning other teams' liveries as well. I like New Garden's shell livery and the yellow submarine McLaughlin as is well. Is that back? I haven't seen it. Is that back? Yeah, the yellow submarine oh, is back. Good, good. Good old. Hunter Ray coming back. We haven't touched on that. 
2014 Indianapolis 500 winner returning. Uh, try and write. But then it was C. It was a while ago, but Karam had like a really angry fit on Twitter about this. I'll say I saw that. So they picked Wilson over Karam this year, and Karam got like really annoyed about it. He made like, I can't remember what it was. I'll have to look at it afterwards. But yeah, Karam got really annoyed at it, which was quite funny. To be fair, I don't know why they picked Wilson over him, but. You know, whatever floats your boat. Um, as it, 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 and the, uh, the canapino livery is a. Uh... Yeah, that's, that's special. Has anyone seen the Ferrucci livery? Oh, yeah. Is that the. Uh, the American one? The American flag, yes. It's so Ferrucci, isn't it? It's very <laughs> Ferrucci. I suppose Ferrucci is another one from this season. He's been absolutely nowhere. I know maybe it's not the greatest machinery, but I expected maybe a few more flashy things from him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's kept fairly quiet, which by Ferrucci is usually a good thing. I mean, I think it's a bit disappointing that he's in a fight because when he when he's got those random call ups, he tends to be quite good. But um, he always does well at Indy, though. So yeah, yeah. Who knows? And I don't know how many drivers really have taken a liking to him, but it's all part of the entertainment. Oh, hang on, this this is a while ago, but. You know, Ferrucci's number 14. Did anyone, did anyone find out why they changed Peterson's number? I do not know. Oh, yeah, wasn't wasn't it accidentally, like, racist or something like yeah, that? Yes, so... Something crazy about that? Peterson's original number was 88 to celebrate AJ for his 88th birthday. And 1488, which are the two numbers of the Foyt cars, has some, like, ideological connection to the Nazis. And Foyt right. had absolutely no idea until people on Twitter just started like saying, "What are you doing? You're like some massive Nazis," and <laughs> that's why they secretly changed Peterson to fifty-five. It's always intriguing. Me. Is there actually any methodology behind which numbers the teams pick? Because there's there's usually some sort of sequence, but I think it's well, I think some of them they just keep for like traditional reasons. So like. I, don't, I can't think of a good example of one that's a traditional number. Uh, but some teams always keep the same numbers, but there's always like McLaren and Methodical with 5, 6, and 7, and Andretti and Methodical with 26, 27, 28, 29. And the rest are just a bit random. Yeah, Mc McLaren have the 6 car, but then Castro Neves is the 06. It's, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's very strange. Yeah, or well, to be fair, Ganassi, they're logical 8, 9, 10, 11. Mm. I think yeah, uh, there, I was, think there I, was one. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I believe teams have to buy the rights to own numbers. I might be All wrong right. on that. We'll have to find that out for the next podcast. I can't. Yeah. There was. I can't remember who it was. There was like, uh, yeah, no, I can't remember. Well, that's straight. But yeah, they picked like Ed Carpenter picked the thirty three because there's like thirty three cars in Indy five hundred and he wanted to win it or something. Like <laughs> he just come up with those rubbish reasons. Like oh my god. Oh, it's, it's, I mean, there's nothing quite like Indy car. Um, oh yeah, no, it was uh, RLL. They have uh, the fifteen, the thirty, and the forty five. Forty five, yes. Yeah, increments of fifteen. Quite. Yeah, it's quite random. And then like teams like Coin just pick eighteen and fifty one. Like, what's the purpose of <laughs> that? Um, oh, but uh, Renus VK also his livery. That one, that's a nice one. I actually like. The, I haven't like seen white it yet. Gold. Has, he, has he got Bitcoin again? Uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> it's a bit Nile. I think that's I no. That that's that's not Bitcoin. No, bit, it's no, that's different. He had Bitcoin the last two years, I think. Really? How, how do? You, huh? How do you yeah, no, yeah. buy Bitcoin? I don't know. No, I, he was definitely sponsored by Bitcoin. What? How do you? What? How does that make? Oh no, no! Bit you know is Bitcoin yeah, actually. Bit is Bitcoin. Is it? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sure the primary that. sponsor was Bitcoin. I swear they called it Bitcoin, not Bit Nile. Not sure, but I, th I think there's still How some you... liveries to come. I think there might still be a few more released. Well, there will definitely be a few more still uh, released before the race. Yeah. If he if he was sponsored by Bitcoin, how does that? How does that work? That's being like being sponsored by the U.S. dollar. That was, it's Who a knows? currency. How do you be sponsored by a currency? Uh, is it because it like gets more people on the site, so then like more traffic on the site, and then that means right. So, so I've got it here. 
BitNile owns and operates a data center at which it mines Bitcoin and provides mission critical products that support a diverse range of industries. So, NFTs. So, I think we've nattered on for quite a while now. Um, so, there we are. There is episode one and a bit of introduction to the Dive from IndyCar podcast, which you can now find on Spotify. Look at us. We're upgrading the world and maybe YouTube if I ever get around to uploading it. So, if you're fortunate enough for watching this on YouTube, well done. If you're listening to this on Spotify, thank you. Your your help and support is much appreciated if you've got this far. If you've got this far, project uh, comment on uh, Instagram post saying, um, I don't know, canapino goat emoji um, on, on the Instagram post, just to let us know you've got this far. Um, be much appreciated. Um, I can already feel the canapino love shining through on the podcast. Let, long may it stay. Um, so I even I'm nattering on now. So that's the end of episode one. Um, just a little bit of an intro and a preview to the month of May. Hopefully you'll next catch us after the GMR Grand Prix on the Indy Road Course. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Right, if, you're watch, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. For listening on Spotify. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you next time.